Hello, today's topic is archaeological laboratory health and safety. Now you may be thinking that there's not a lot of reason to be concerned about safety in archaeological labs, and admittedly they're not as dangerous as some labs in, say, chemistry or high energy physics, but that doesn't mean that they're without hazards, and in fact some archaeological labs even use chemicals or sources of radiation. So you need to know what the potential hazards are in archaeological labs and how to mitigate those, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We need to keep in mind that the materials we find in our archaeological labs were originally excavated out of dirt. Since artifacts are dirty and could even have been buried in contaminated soil, it's important that we mitigate that by wearing gloves and lab coat, never eating in a lab, and making sure that we wash our hands as soon as we leave the lab. A number of the activities that archaeologists carry out in labs can be damaging to the eyes and it's important that we mitigate these. Among the things we can do is avoid touching our face or our eyes when we're working in the lab, wearing gloves, uh, and also wearing goggles in particular circumstances, and also paying attention to sources of eye strain. So we should avoid touching our eyes, change our gloves periodically, wear safety goggles, and if we're using chemicals, make sure it has an eye wash station. We should also be careful that there's adequate natural light and that we can periodically change our focus so we're not constantly focused on things really close, really close to our face. Where we see this in particular is in microscope work, which can cause a lot of eye strain. A major source of eye strain in an archaeological lab is using microscopes. We use these for a variety of reasons, such as examining retouch on tools, looking for use wear traces, examining charred seeds, charcoal, all kinds of things. And uh, sometimes that work goes on for hours and hours. So it can lead to a lot of eye strain. One of the things that's very important when you're using a microscope, particularly for long periods of time, is to make sure the ergonomics are, are good, and in particular that they're good in terms of your eyesight. One of the things I strongly recommend is that you always place the microscope in good natural light, close to a window. There's a window right over here, as a matter of fact. And uh, that way, when you're looking through the microscope, long periods of time and your eyes your eyes would get very tired if you were constantly focused on such short distances so what you can do then is every once in a while you look up and look out the window and focus on something far away and this is the best way to relax your eyes and change the focus periodically so that you don't suffer a lot of eye, eye strain another recommendation I would make is don't do uninterrupted microscope work for hours on end what you should do is do it for an hour, hour and a half maybe, and then take a break and do something else and then come back to the microscope afterwards because that also will reduce your eye strain considerably. Now one of the more dangerous things that archaeologists often do in their labs is flint napping. And we're, I'm not going to give you a good demonstration of flint napping here today, but I just want to make the point that when you do flint napping, it, it involves sharp edges and more to the point, small pieces of flint or obsidian or other material with sharp edges flying in unpredictable directions. So one of the first things you need to do is make sure you're wearing safety goggles. Because if you get a sharp piece of flint in your eye, that's a serious matter and you need to go to the hospital and you might have permanent eye damage. It's very important to make sure that your eyes are protected. Another one is to wear safety gloves, some kind of work gloves. Now these aren't particularly good ones, but they still do the job. But if you're doing a lot of flint napping, you probably get, want to get ones that fit better to your hand. Uh, they aren't quite so clumsy as these ones are, but these will do well enough for demonstration purposes. So when we're doing flint napping, we'd use a hammer, if we're doing hard hammer flint napping, we'd use a hammer stone and a, a large flake or a core. And we would want to hit it near the edge of the platform in order to remove a flake. And when that happens, small bits of flint can fly in all kinds of directions. So let's try that right now. Okay, so right now I have uh, these pieces are just flying on the floor. But you never know where they're going to go because they can bounce and it can be quite dangerous. So you really do need to take the napping seriously. Uh, a lot of people think it's some kind of macho activity that you don't want to be wearing safety equipment, but that really makes no sense at all. It really if you're going to take flint napping seriously, that has to include proper health and safety. 
Something that archaeologists not uncommonly do is taking bags of sediment from archaeological excavations and screening them through stacks of sieves, like this one here, or even higher stacks of sieves, uh, nested with the largest aperture on top and the smallest at the bottom, and then a pan at the very bottom to collect anything even smaller than that. And we can do this for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's sometimes in a connection with uh, archaeobotany uh, as a way of sort sorting uh, sediments to look for seeds and that sort of thing. It can also be used to look for small shell, fish bone, uh, and so on. Or it can be used uh, uh, to look for micro debitage and other kinds of micro remains from archaeological sites. We want to quite often sort them by size, and then we can sort through each size fraction to look for tiny objects that might be in those sediments. So we would place a bag of sediment, usually a little bit bigger than this, in the top screen, and often uh, has place the stack of screens on something called a screen shaker that, ag that agitates it mechanically so that it causes all of the uh, stuff to sink down to the bottom, or the finest particles to sink to the, to the bottom. But one of the problems with that is that while it's doing that, it also creates a large amount of dust, especially when you're screening dry sediments, which is generally the case. So if you're doing that kind of work, it's extremely important that you wear a dust mask because inhaling that dust, particularly if it contains a lot of silica and so on, it can be very bad for your lungs. So make sure that you always wear some kind of respiratory protection if you're doing a lot of screening through stacks of sieves like this. However, dust is not the only potential respiratory hazard in an archaeological lab. Some labs use silica gel as a desiccant to protect metals in their storage areas, for example, and when you're moving silica gel around, you really need to wear a dust mask. But dust masks will not mitigate all the hazards, in particular chemical fumes. If you're using chemicals in your lab, it's really important for you to have a fume hood, or if a fume hood's not available, to wear a special resp respirator mask that will protect you from those fumes. Some archaeological activities pose the risk of cuts and burns. Aside from flint napping, the more prevalent of these tend to be ones involving lab ovens and kilns. Obviously, whenever we're around very high temperatures, we should be using oven mitts or some other protection for our hands. And in many cases, it makes sense to wear a heavy apron as well in case some hot objects should fall against us. One type of injury that can occur in archaeological laboratories is back injury. And one of the reasons for that is that some artifacts and other materials that archaeologists are analyzing can be quite heavy. And more especially, we quite often place a large number of those such objects in a, in a tray or a drawer or a box that we have to move from place to place. And it's in the course of moving those things or removing them from drawers or cupboards that we are at most risk of having a back injury. So if you needed to move a box like this one here, Rather than picking it up and then lugging it across the room or into another room, something like that, you're far better off to put it on a wheeled cart. And every laboratory should have one of these wheeled carts. And that way you can wheel it to the next room safely. Just as you'd want to use a cart to move a large box of artifacts across a room or into another room, you also need to be careful of remove when you're removing drawers from storage cabinets to make sure you don't in injure your back. So a typical storage ca cabinet in an archaeological lab has many shallow drawers uh, stacked quite high in the cabinet. And one might be tempted to take the top drawer from here and pull it out and try to do something like this to pull it out and carry it across the room. Very bad idea, especially if this is loaded with lithics or ground stone or something like that that's very heavy. And you're pretty likely to injure your back in doing that. So if you do have to remove a drawer like that from a high part of the cabinet, we should always use some kind of step stool or stair. Uh, these, these particular kinds of stairs are particularly good because they're very stable. Uh, they wheel around, but then when, once you stand on them, they press down on the floor, they're very stable. And they also have a kind of a resting area here, so that when you pull the door out, you can drop it immediately onto that resting area so you're not, again, injuring your back. And this is a really good setup for an archaeological lab. I highly recommend having these kinds of step stools. While most archaeological labs don't make use of a lot of chemicals, there are a couple of chemicals that are commonly found in archaeological labs. Among them is acetone, 
acetone is a solvent that can be used to dissolve an acrylic to make sealants and adhesives, for example, adhesives for joining pottery together. Um, and sealants are particularly important for uh, adhering labels on artifacts and sealing those labels so that the labels don't fall off of the artifact. Or if you uh, ink the label directly on the artifact, you put the sealant layer over top to protect that label. Because it's very important to make sure that labels don't disappear from artifacts. Uh, another chemical that archaeologists use pretty regularly is uh, acetic acid or vinegar. Uh, acetic acid can be used uh, to drip onto carbonate incrustations that often occur on artifacts and bones to help us remove those more easily. And um, even though acetic acid is not particularly dangerous, we should treat all acids with respect. Uh, one thing you should know about acids in case you have to use them is that when you're trying to dilute an acid, you should never pour water into an acid because it can often splash and, and get acid on yourself and your clothing. Um, you always, always pour the acid into water instead. Now, no matter what kind of chemicals you use, it's important to make sure that your lab station that has the chemicals has a binder that contains uh, descriptions of every chemical you use and what its characteristics are, uh, what hazards they entail, uh, how you how you mitigate those hazards, and especially what you do if there's a spill or somebody accidentally ingests some, and that sort of thing. Those material uh, safety data sheets that we keep in a binder like this or in a um, folder attached to the fume hood uh, is a very important thing that you must have in your lab. Whenever you're using chemicals that produce fumes, and acetone does produce fumes, it can be dangerous, you should use them under a fume hood. And in fact, any chemical that has even fairly mildly irritating fumes should be used in a very well ventilated space. But a fume hood is actually a really good uh, piece of equipment to have. Now what else can I say about uh, using and handling chemicals of the sorts that archaeologists uh, tend to use? One is that every chemical you use, every beaker, bottle, jar uh, should be labeled. So this one, for example, has uh, acryloid B72, that's an acrylic, dissolved in acetone, uh, and it says here it's mixed to 10% concentration. You should always make sure the concentration is indicated, although in the case of anything dissolved in acetone, the concentration increases over time because the acetone evaporates, one of the reasons we have to keep it under a fume hood. So very important to label them. Even when it's something uh, that's not dangerous, like this one, contains water, distilled water, H distilled H2O. Still need to label it because people need to know what is in every bottle. Because, for example, somebody could take over your lab and find all these bottles sitting here. If they don't know what they are, they don't even know how to dispose of them properly. And you know, for all they know, this could be something dangerous. And in fact, it's only water, so it's good for them to know that. Um, this one, similarly, is labeled ethanol, 95%. That's pretty strong stuff. Obviously, it would be diluted for most uh, kinds of use. Um, ethanol. Uh, can be used for uh, dissolving away certain kinds of organic substances on artifacts. Um, another, other things that dark elves often have in their lab are uh, things like fingernail polish. Uh, unfortunately, they don't usually tell you the ingredients of the fingernail polish. It's a bit of a problem. But you can be sure that some one of the ingredients of the fingernail polish is acetone. So you need to keep that under a, under a fume hood as well. Among the other things you should know about, uh, about chemicals is that when you're going to use a chemical like acetone, only take as much as you need for the job, put it in a temporary jar, label that jar immediately, and while you're using it, do not put it near the edge of a counter or anything like that because it can get knocked onto the floor uh, and cause a spill. You always use it some distance away from the edge of the, of the workspace. And it's also important for that workspace to be away from a high traffic area. You don't want a lot of people around, especially children, while you're working on this kind of stuff. Now, uh, when you're finished with that chemical, if there's any little bit left over, you dispose of it in a proper disposal container. Never put the chemicals down the drain. And then you have to wash the container immediately in soap and water. Another thing I should mention when you're handling chemicals, and indeed when you're handling a lot of kinds of uh, more sensitive artifacts, you should always wear gloves. And the best kind of gloves to wear are called nitrile, nitrile gloves. They actually will come in boxes that look kind of like tissue boxes. This one happens to be latex gloves. They're not quite as good as the nitrile gloves. 
can also get heavier duty nitrile gloves, like these ones here that uh, look more like your standard uh, rubber gloves you'd use for washing dishes or whatever. Um, but those are really good if you're going to be handling things like acids and whatnot, because you certainly don't want to splash any on your skin. If you're working with, work, uh, with uh, nitrile gloves for a long period of time, you should change them fairly regularly. And you should still avoid touching your face, because you could get chemicals, or if you're handling artifacts, you can also get dirt on your hands. And you should avoid touching your face, because even the gloves will pick up that material. And if you transfer it to your face, it would not be good. So changing the gloves every hour or so is not a bad idea. Just to summarize, whenever we're handling chemicals, we should wear protective clothing like lab coats and gloves and goggles. We should keep chemicals away from high traffic areas and never leave them in unlabeled containers. Do not leave them near the edge of counters or other places where they could get knocked over, and only take as much as you need for the job. Furthermore, don't ever eat, drink, or smoke when using chemicals. In any lab that employs chemicals, it's important to have something called a spill kit, because you never know when you might spill some chemicals on the floor. This is an example of a spill kit here. It's essentially a box or a shelf that has a number of other boxes in it. Uh, the ones on the top shelf here are clearly labeled as being the stuff you would use for cleaning up solvents. These ones are for cleaning up spilled acids. And this one down here is for cleaning up caustic materials. Uh, this box here is equipment that you would use while cleaning up the spill, uh, but it's actually better to have uh, equipment already handy um, outside the spill kit so you don't have to break this open. This is kind of an emergency when for some reason you can't find the proper equipment. One of those pieces of equipment, of course, is goggles, which you should have on anyway if you're handling something like acid. Um, and another one is gloves. So let's say we spilled some acid on the floor and we want to clean it up. We would want to make sure that we are wearing nitrile gloves and goggles or perhaps a face shield. Uh, then we would grab one of the neutralizing agents that's labeled for acids, break it open, break the seal here, break the box open, sprinkle it on the acid, and then take a metal dustpan, not a plastic one, and stir around the acid mixture, or the acid and neutralizer mixture, uh, and the, the neutralizer will react with the acid and basically use up its potency. And then we use that same dustpan to shovel the remains into a metal bucket. They can be then taken for disposal or even just put under a fume hood so that the fumes that are still being given off by this mixture can be uh, take, taken away from your lab. If you need to store chemicals, they need to be in a cool, well-ventilated, and lockable cabinet away from most people. Never store acids and bases in the same cabinet, and never store oxidizing agents with solvents. If there are any of the chemicals are flammable, they need to be in explosion-proof cabinets. And it's also very important to label the cabinet doors to indicate their contents, such as acids and solvents. Biological hazards are relatively uncommon in archaeological labs, but they can occur in zoo archaeological laboratories where they have to process animal carcasses for reference collections and in some kinds of experimental archaeology. We can mitigate these best by good hygiene, wearing masks and nit nitrile gloves, and we also have to make sure we dispose of rotted or contaminated flesh in biohazard bins, not just in regular garbage. However, we should also use common sense. Keep in mind that fresh meat or bone used in an experiment is no more dangerous than what you can find in your refrigerator at home. Similarly, it's not very common to find radiation hazards in archaeological laboratories, but they can occur in cases where the archaeologists are trying to analyze materials with such methods as X-ray fluorescence or neutron activation analysis. And those, those kinds of methods generate ionizing radiation, which can be quite dangerous to humans. So consequently, uh, use of such instruments generally requires some kind of licensing, 
We also should be using shielding or other precautions to protect ourselves and those around us while we're doing the analysis. And uh, in many cases, it's necessary to wear dosimeters to monitor, monitor radiation exposures. I hope you found that introduction to archaeological lab safety useful. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, most archaeological labs are actually quite safe. But obviously, I had to hit the highlights of some of the things you might need to worry about, depending on the kind of archaeological work you're doing. If you found it useful and you'd like to be updated on my future videos on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button below. Meanwhile, enjoy archaeology and stay safe. You can learn more about archaeological lab safety in Chapter 10 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, available from Springer.